Um, Professor Paul Craig is currently Professor of English Law at the University of Oxford and a Fellow at St John's College. Paul is a specialist in administrative and EU law. He was educated at Worcester College, Oxford, where he took his BA, MA and BCL. He stayed at Worcester and was made Fellow in 1976. He remained a Fellow until his move to St John's in 1998. He currently teaches courses in administrative law and European Union law at the Indiana University School of Law, Bloomington. He also lectures in constitutional law at the University of Oxford. Um, Professor Paul Craig today will speak on meta-constitutional narratives, some comparative thoughts. Thank you so much, and can I just echo once again my thanks for the wonderful conference that Taran Barra and I put together it's a it's been a great three days and i've enjoyed it immensely um, so what i'm going to be talking about a meta constitutional narratives some comparative thoughts and my theme actually develops rather neatly from what carol's talking about so that's rather um, fortuitous but good nonetheless Meta constitutional narratives can, in effect, be deployed for two purposes. There's no a priori reason why such a narrative should have the same meaning in both contexts. The primary focus may, as in relation to the basic structure doctrine, be internal. There's the idea being that a Supreme Court elevates certain precepts to meta constitutional status with the result of constraining political organs as to the changes, substantive or procedural, that they can make. And there's been a lot of discussion of that. Um, Cheryl has focused on that. Sylvia has done wonderful work on it. A lot of, um, uh, a lot of attention has been devoted to that. My focus in this paper is going to be on the external dimension of meta-constitutional narratives. And this is where meta-constitutional narratives are used to protect, by courts, to protect certain values of that legal and political system from incursion by other legal and political orders. Now, the theme which I'm going to be deploying is that underlying this external face of the meta-constitutional narrative is an attachment to autoctony Autoctony, the etymological foundations of Greek, they connote the idea of springing from the land or grown from the soil. And while there are diverse interpretations of the term, a prominent strand nonetheless embodies the descriptive and normative ideal of attachment to indigenous or, na or native values. It stands in counterpoise to themes of globalization and indeed, I think it may actually be causally connected to themes of globalization. This is sort of pushed back by national systems against globalization and is expressive at the most basic level of the desire to maintain, maintain some degree of national control. Now, what I'm going to be arguing in the paper and in other work that I've been doing in this area is that, in fact, there are three different dimensions to the external face of autochthony, what I call um, status, source, and substantive autochthony, the precise meaning of which I'll make clear in due course. And that those are three different kinds of technique which national legal systems use as ways of operating as a barrier or filter to norms coming in from the outside. Now, I've only got a very limited amount of time so I'm going to, but I am going to try and touch on and develop this idea or exemplify this idea in relation to three different legal orders, Germany, the UK, and the EU. Now, the, let me begin straight away then with Germany. The German um, uh, conception of autochthony is best demonstrated, not only, but best and most visibly demonstrated by the jurisprudence of the Bundeswehrfassungsgericht in relation to the membership of the EU. 
Now the concept of status autochthony is powerfully demonstrated in the jurisprudence of the Bundeswehr-Fassungrich by its insistence right from the very inception that the status of EU law in Germany was dependent upon provisions of the German constitution, Article 23.1 as it now is. They did not buy into the communautaire reasoning of the Court of Justice in Costa and Nell and subsequent cases. Instead, they affirmed very, uh, very firmly that, in fact, the status of EU law within their own legal order was dependent upon their own constitution. And that's one manifestation of what I call status autochthony, maintaining control of the status of norms from outside within your own legal system by insisting that they're grounded in provisions of your own legal system. More recently, we have a very powerful exemplification of the notion of substantive autochthony in the German jurisprudence. German jurisprudence is famous for being uh, the most activist body of jurisprudence, which is which pushes back against the EU legal order, and it pushes back in various ways. And the way which I want to just touch on now is in evident in the Lisbon judgment. This was a judgment of the Bundeswehr Fassungrich looking at the constitutionality from German, the German perspective of Germans, uh, the Germany's ratification of the Lisbon Treaty. And basically, the, what the German court did in this instance is it forged what is known in the jargon of a trade as certain identity laws. And those were, this is not just my phrase, this is their phrase. The court reasoned as follows. It said European unification on the basis of the treaty union of sovereign states could not be achieved in such a way that insufficient space was left to the member states for the political form formation of the economic, cultural, and social living conditions in that state. And they uh, then devised five kinds of identity lock. And these identity locks were very powerful. These were actually, the court was actually saying, if the EU tries to enact legislation, which is in these areas, we, in principle, may not apply it because it interferes with the protected identity in the German legal order. And the five different identity uh, components of the identity law were, firstly, the, that um, uh, decisions on substantive and formal criminal law, secondly, dispositions, uh, the disposition of the monopoly on the use of force by the police within the state and by the military within the state towards external enemies. Um, thirdly, fundamental fiscal decisions on public revenue and expenditure, the latter being particularly motivated into alia by social policy considerations. Decisions on the shaping of living conditions in a social state, uh, that was number four. And number five, decisions of particular cultural importance for example, on family law, the school, and the education system, and on dealing with religious communities. Three brief comments on this substantive conception of autochthony developed by the Bundeswehr Fassung group. It was developed by the court, but the first comment is almost all German commentators question the derivation and of and authority of those five tenets of German identity that remained, quote, immune from EU regulation. The FCC, the, uh, the Federal Constitutional Court, provided scant, if any, justification for the list, which, when analyzed from the German historical perspective, is actually pretty problematic. Secondly, a second comment on this. The FCC, the Bundeswehr Fassungrich, has frequently criticized the Court of Justice of the European Union for being too activist by developing EU law in too teleological a manner with scant justification from the treaties. Whatsoever the truth of that claim, the FCC did not appreciate the irony that its defense against the EU was crafted 
using just such activist and controversial reasoning techniques to construct a German sense of identity. The capacity of superior courts to wear intellectual blinkers in that way is quite remarkable. Thirdly, the third point to note about the German jurisprudence is that actions have consequences, and that trite proposition applies as much to legal decisions as any other. If a legal system decides to apply locks, then it must determine the content of them and how to apply them. And that trite proposition leads to a less obvious one. While the very language of locks is indicative of asymmetrical power, someone imposing constraints on someone else, the reality is in fact a good deal more complex, and the reason's not hard to divine. The creator of the lock has to live with the very constraint that it has fashioned. Tough talk, whether by national courts or legislators, leading to tight locks has consequences for the author. The tighter the lock, the more demanding it is for the creator, not just for the person or institution constraint. That's fine if the creator of the lock really wishes to follow through the implications of its constraint. It's deeply problematic if the creator becomes equivocal about the content and application of the lock that it has created. It then has to find ways of backing off or softening the constraint that it has devised without thereby losing credibility. There's, I should say at this juncture, a rather nice joke about three academics who, German academics, who um, uh, have just seen a new uh, decision from the Bundeswehrfassungsgericht, which had just been handed down, like the Lisbon judgment, and they're all having a beer together, and one of the academics says, I must brush off and uh, write an article saying how marvelous this decision is. And then the second one says, I've got to rush off and say, write an article saying how terrible this decision was. No basis for it, no normative foundation. And they both rush off, and the third academic sitting there, sipping his beer. And the two academics turn around simultaneously to the third academic who's sipping his beer and say, aren't you coming? You know, what are you doing? He says, I'm waiting for the, uh, for the Bundeswehr Fassenberg to change his mind. And I'm just <laughs> sipping my beer while I do so. Um, Okay, my time is uh, moving on. Let me just give an example from the UK context. And again, I have to uh, limit what I can say. But let me just take an example from the uh, relationship between the UK and the ECHR, which demonstrates all these different forms of autochthony, albeit in different ways. So, um, what I would like to argue is that the, in relation to autochthony and status, autochthony and status you find manifest in the debate in the UK, which is a rich debate, about what's known as the mirror principle, which is um, <coughs> the status of ECHR judgments within the UK legal and political order and the extent to which the UK courts, the extent to which the UK courts should be able to develop their own indigenous conceptions of human rights. Now, uh, pretty much everyone accepts that ECHR judgment should be a flaw beneath which you cannot fall. The real debate is whether they should be a ceiling or not whether UK courts should have freedom to develop the uh, notions of uh, convention rights, even if the ECHR, the European Court of Human Rights, has not done so. Now, um, there's a lot of academic literature on this. There's quite a lot of judicial case law on this. But at bottom, what's really at stake with the debate about the mirror principle is the conception of how far we should be able to fashion and have control of the status and development of convention rights within our own legal order. So what then about, given again limits of time, what about autochthony and what I call source? Again, we've got 
a rather neat and powerful exemplification of that in recent jurisprudence of the Supreme Court. This recent jurisprudence, which is evident in particular in two major decisions, uh, in Osborne and in the BBC case, both of which were crafted skillfully by Lord Reed. And the message here coming from Lord Reed was that um, the common law should be regarded as the first port of call in determining whether we were in compliance with convention rights or not. Yes, we would look to ECHR jurisprudence, but the idea was very much, let's see if we can comply with ECHR jurisprudence by having recourse to our own homegrown conceptions of natural justice or whatever the issue was in the particular case, in order thereby to fashion a result which is both compliant and consistent with the ECHR on the one hand, but is also tailored to the actual needs and cultural identity of the UK legal order. And that's what's driving the Osborne and um, uh, BBC jurisprudence. That's what's driving this idea. This, I this idea of source autochthony is what is driving this body of case law. Um, again, very briefly given limits of time, the most powerful dimension of substantive autochthony is to be found in the very powerful debate which is going on about the extent to which, in substantive terms, the UK really should be bound by ECHR jurisprudence. And what's notable about this debate is there's a debate in which judges themselves, speaking judicially and extrajudicially, have taken a very major role. So if you, uh, the main protagonists have been people like Lord Judge, been people like Lord Hoffman, people like Lord Sumption. Now, all three of those judges, albeit in different ways, are pushing back very firmly, substantively, on the extent to which, substantively, Strasbourg should be able to set the human rights agenda for the UK. Just to take one example, Lord Hoffman contends that human rights are universal in, in abstraction, but national in application, with the consequence that an international court could not properly decide individual cases, more especially when the number of signatory states to the ECHR had more than quadrupled in recent years. To take an example used by Lord Hoffman, the right to fair trial did not, said Lord Hoffman, demand the same trial procedure in all countries, and he was unconvinced that the margin of appreciation alleviated that difficulty. The message from Lord Hoffman was unequivocal. If rights-based rights review was to happen, it should happen at home and be done by English courts, UK courts. In a similar vein, Lord Sumption, while acknowledging the importance of convention rights, criticised the Strasbourg Court for being, quote, the international flag bearer of a judge made fundamental law, extending well beyond the text which it is charged with applying the driving instrument being, in his, uh, in his words, the living instrument doctrine, which, quote, transformed the convention from the safeguard against despotism, which was intended by its draftsmen, into a template for many aspects of the domestic legal order. OK, um, three minutes on on my third example. I've got much more I could say than all of these examples. But just three minutes then on the third example, which is the EU. Wonderful example about autocracy in the EU is the EU's recent, very recent, and very controversial opinion called Opinion 213. This opinion was an opinion given by the European Court of Justice as to whether the EU could 
join up to the ECHO. So this was the EU joining up to the European Convention on Human Rights. Now, little tiny bit of background for those who may not be aware of this. The Lisbon Treaty contains an obligation, not a power, an obligation to join. It was an obligation without a specific timeline, but it was a definitive obligation nonetheless, a substantive obligation for the EU to sign up. That led to a team from both sides negotiating an agreement, a draft agreement, uh, over a couple of years, which was subject to lots of input, including input from the ECJ. But nonetheless, when the, the agreement was tested before the court, the court, in a very complex judgment, actually says this agreement is not acceptable from the EU legal order for five reasons. Now, I'm not going to get into those five reasons because it would take me way beyond my time, and I can't possibly do that. But what I want to emphasize is that while most commentators have dived in and analyzed each of those five reasons, including myself, you need to see those five reasons against the background conception of the EU legal order, which underpins everything that they say thereafter. And this is not something that I'm inventing. If I need to invent something, I'll tell you I'm inventing it. But on this occasion, I don't need to invent it. They spend about 15 paragraphs of their judgment talking about the conception of the EU legal order against which membership of the ECR, ECHR was going to be judged. Now, picking up a theme which I developed from the German jurisprudence, courts have an inherent capacity to paint the conception of their own legal order thickly or thinly, and they are in the driving seat. Now, what you have in Opinion 213 is actually the EU devising an incredibly thick conception of the autonomy of the EU legal order. The specific characteristics and autonomy of the EU legal order are painted incredibly thickly uh, by the uh, Court of Justice. And the consequence is that that shapes everything that they say thereafter. Because in effect, everything that they say thereafter is said against the background of this very thick conception. And it's quite clear that this thick conception of autochtony of the EU legal order is designed, they did not use this word, but it is nonetheless consciously designed as a barrier, literally a uh, physical and conceptual and legal barrier to the kind of norms that we can accept from elsewhere. Okay, let me, let me stop there. It does therefore seem to me that there's a lot of this out there once you start seeing it. Okay? A lot of this stuff out there, and I'd be very interested in experience from other legal systems which demonstrate the same kind of themes. But it does seem to me, I'm not saying it's invalid to have these ideas of autotomy. I'm not saying that at all. What I am saying, my message is, we need to recognize that there is a meta-constitutional narrative going on here. We need to recognize the creativity of courts in shaping that meta-constitutional narrative. And we need to bring our own critical faculties to bear on an assessment of the meta-constitutional narrative chosen by a particular constitutional court in just the same way as if as, um, as when we are reflecting on the meta-constitutional narratives used in their internal dimensions, such as the basic structure doctrine. Thank you very much.